Hey everyone, it's Mojax back in the DJ City UK lab today with a special end of year wrap up video looking back at some of the big and small stories from the DJ technology industry and the DJ game as a whole during 2020. Let's get to it. One of the biggest winning categories in the DJ tech industry this year was entry level kit. With people stuck at home for long periods, affordable controllers made it easy for people to dip their toes into DJing for the first time, and there were some notable new ones. Newmark's latest iteration of their mix track line, the Pro FX and Platinum FX, offer superb value for money, with layouts and feel akin to much more expensive hardware. Likewise, the Hercules DJ Control Impulse 500 received a lot of love from myself and other reviewers. The company's hardware has often lent on novelty features to stand out from the crowd, but the 500 is a solid, well-designed performer. Pioneer DJ didn't bring out anything in the real budget end, although by all accounts they were selling the DDJ400 hand over fist anyway, so that didn't really matter. But they did debut the DDJ FLX6, which although not exactly a budget controller, selling at $600, was aimed squarely at bedroom hobbyist DJs. There was nothing new from Reloop until the end of the year, but they've just announced the Buddy, designed for Algorithms DJ, so I'll be looking at that one as soon as possible. On the subject of algorithm, they were at the forefront of a new trend that we saw in the DJ game this year, source separation, live stem creation, or as they call it, neural mix. This uses some fairly advanced AI to split tracks into different elements, beats, instruments, and vocals on the fly, the theory being that you should be able to create smoother blends than when you rely on filters or EQ to subtract frequencies from tracks. They weren't the only ones going down that path. Virtual DJ now offers something similar with their stems feature, and I've been playing with an app called Stemverter, which lets you do the same separation on tracks ahead of time to use in other DJ software or in your DAW. The whole idea seems very exciting, and although I haven't had time to dive properly into it yet, it's on my agenda for 2021 for sure. Whilst we're talking about DJ, Algorithm have also just debuted another new feature, Gesture Control, as demonstrated here by DJ Ravine. You should definitely check the full video out on his channel. I'm actually really curious about how many of you guys and girls watching this use DJ, either as your main software or as an additional option. Do let me know in the comments below, as if the interest is there, I'll look to do a lot more content on that topic next year. When it comes to high-end battle mixers, things got very interesting in 2020. Rain started the year with their new 70, followed by the 72 Mark II, a refinement of the original 72 released in 2018. Then in October, after much speculation and a few leaks, Pioneer DJ dropped the DJM S11, almost five years after its predecessor, the DJM S9. It retained a similar feel to the S9, but brought with it a huge stack of new features, some of which are clearly a reaction to what Rain did with the 72, and many others which came completely out of left field. The upshot of all this, some serious competition going on in the space, and I love to see it. The one clear winner is Serato, as although the S11 is compatible with Rekordbox, it clearly is a Serato DJ Pro device first and foremost. That company's dominance in the DVS turntable using market remains unchallenged, and with new features like Scratch Bank coming to all of the mixers in this category, that's not about to change anytime soon. 2020 wasn't perhaps the ideal year to debut a new top-tier media player designed for clubs and festivals to buy, but supply chains being what they are, Pioneer DJ obviously couldn't hold back the CDJ3000, and very impressive it is too. I have yet to do my full review, but as I made clear in my first look, the company's hands were tied a little. If they moved too far from what came before, then a lot of big-name DJs would be upset, and so the 3000 feels more like a refinement of the 2000 Nexus 2 than a reinvention in many ways, although there is clearly a lot more power under the hood than is being utilised right now. I think they're going to have to be a long-term review project for me, as I can imagine some pretty significant updates happening in 2021. Den on DJ, on the other hand, spent 2020 throwing out updates and upgrades to their Prime Series hardware at a rapid pace. To be fair, the SE 6000s were also more a refinement of their older 5000s than a complete overhaul, but then the 5000s were well ahead of the game in terms of features already. 
The 6000s with their giant screen and more refined aesthetics struck a chord with a lot of DJs this year, especially as when there aren't any clubs open to play in, the idea of what is the club standard becomes somewhat moot. I'll touch on streaming more later, but being able to play tracks from streaming services is one area where the Prime series is, for now at least, really pushing the limits of media player tech, and I remain a huge fan of their spinning platter option, the SC6000M. As with the Battle Mixer space, the Media Player Wars are far from over yet, and that's good for everyone. I'm sure the next year we'll see a ton more innovation coming from both sides, and I am here for it. With nothing new from Alan and Heath, and Denon DJ releasing a minimal update to their offering with the X1850, the story of club mixers in 2020 was all about the DJ MV10 from Pioneer DJ. And without question, it's one of my favourite products of the year in any category. Incredible sound quality, flexible and powerful effects options, and a quality crossfader. Combined with the six channels and all the connectivity any venue could need, it really ticks all the boxes for what a club install mixer should be. It even has Serato DJ Pro club kit support for DVS users. It won't likely make its way into a huge number of home setups costing as it does around $3,000, but there's no doubt in my mind that once things start to return to normality, we'll be seeing a lot of DJM V10s in venues. Towards the end of the year, the company also released the DJM V10 LF, effectively the same mixer but with longer line faders and no crossfader. I'm not as much of a fan of that one, it reduces the flexibility of the mixer and turns it into a more niche product, but no doubt it will make some DJs very happy. Speaking of niche, I must give a quick mention to Master Sounds. The company managed to produce a third version of their Radius 2 and 4 rotary mixers, retaining the same sound and build quality as on older iterations, but at a significantly lower price. As someone who really enjoys playing on rotaries, the more affordable options are out there on the market, the happier I am. And on that note, I've also got a review of the very budget Omnitronic TRM402 coming soon, which, whilst not on the same level as the Master Sounds offerings, still proved itself as a quality product to me this year. Watch this space for that one. There's one potentially huge shift which has begun this year, the ramifications of which have yet to be fully apparent. After promising it for a while, Apple launched a raft of new MacBooks and a Mac Mini with their own M1 chips. These chips are based on ARM architecture instead of the Intel x86, which has been the core of their computers for over a decade. Whilst Apple's Rosetta 2 seems to do a good job with running older apps in emulation, long term, this means that for best performance, the major DJ software developers will have to make some heavyweight changes to their applications in future, with the only one currently native to the M1 being predictably Algorithms DJ. Apple do still sell Intel-based machines, at least for now, but this may well be the last generation. So, will 2021 see a lot more DJs moving over to Windows laptops instead? I've been using custom-built audio laptops from Schenker, now branded XMG, for a couple of years now, and I don't miss MacBooks for DJing at all. Right now, this could go in either direction. Performing with M1 chips could turn out to be DJ Nirvana, or DJs might switch wholesale to Intel-based Windows machines. Interesting times indeed, and something to look out for for next year. By the end of 2019, I'd got to the point where I found Phase from MWM to be reliable pretty much 100% of the time. I was happy with it. But then at the NAM show in January, they announced a collaboration with Serato, meaning that the device would work as an official Serato accessory, no RCA cables required, working in internal mode. Like everyone else, I was excited by this prospect and was looking forward to using Phase in that way. But sadly, here we are almost a year later and nothing. The project is clearly well underway and it is still happening. And being pragmatic, it's far better to have a delayed release rather than rush something unfinished out of the door. I'm sure MWM have learnt that lesson by now. But still, it's a bit disappointing to not have that feature rolled out yet. Hopefully, it won't be too long into 2021 before we see it. I'll also mention a perennial on my disappointments list, Native Instruments Tractor. It still seems to be in a holding pattern, occasionally showing signs of life but then hiding away again. I love Tractor, it's still a unique and powerful piece of DJ software, and I sincerely hope that one day it will return to its former glory. Yeah. 
Before I get to the two biggest topics of 2020, I have to do a few honourable mentions, mainly for products that I've been testing but haven't reviewed yet. I'm sure I'll forget some, the backlog is pretty huge, but these are what come to mind. They include fantastic bags from Magma, UDG and the new Snap from Jetpack, which is really innovative. I've also got a bunch of Odyssey products very overdue, including more bags and their excellent L Stand 360 laptop stand. When I started working back in the lab again after our first lockdown in the UK, I got a deck stand in from Glorious DJ, as I wanted to try something a bit more bespoke than an IKEA hack that I've usually used in the past, and that has impressed me so far. The review is shot and will be out in a few weeks. There's a few speakers too. I reviewed the Adam Audio T8V Studio monitors, but I've also got the Kali Audio LP8 on test. Heavily requested those, and perhaps I'll do a big 8 inch studio monitor shootout next year if you guys and girls are interested. Plus, there are a couple of portable powered PA solutions from JBL in the lab. Reviews on those also coming soon. The Rain 12 Mark II's got the first look treatment, but not a review yet. They seem to be even more popular than the original versions, offering, as they do, wider compatibility with software other than Serato DJ Pro. You'll find out my product of the year shortly, but one of the close runner-ups was the Prime Go from Denon DJ. A unique product in the market, the portable powerhouse really won my heart. It's not for everyone, certainly not turntableists, but it's a huge amount of fun and a serious piece of hardware, all in one package. I've got a lot deeper into lighting this year, mainly thanks to SoundSwitch making the dark arts of DMX seem more approachable than in the past. I'll be looking more closely at that, as well as record box lighting and new fixtures from Colorkey and Ape Labs in the coming months, along with some other more mobile DJ focused topics. Finally, I also need to mention the Autophon VNL cartridges. Aside from companies making third-party M44 needle replacements, Autophon are really the only game in town when it comes to DJ cartridges available everywhere in the world, and so it's great to see them keep pushing in different directions when they really don't need to. The full review on those is coming in a few weeks. Okay, so this topic is pretty tricky for me to navigate working as I do for BeatSource slash BeatPort, but I've said this before and it's even more true now. I believe our streaming services, BeatSource and BeatPort Link, are the best services out there. It would be rather odd if we didn't believe that. We make them to be the best. You can try them out for free to decide for yourself, but naturally our services are the ones that I use. Putting that aside though, whichever service you decide is best for you, the integration of streaming into DJ software and hardware feels increasingly like a paradigm shift to me. Like media players in the early 2010s, DJing with a laptop in the 2000s, and the use of CDs becoming mainstream before that in the late 90s. In many respects, I still cling to the older ways myself. I play vinyl 45 sets for example, I have a love for physical media, and I'll never give up my carefully curated library of local files. But thanks to the integrations of our link services into Recordbox, Serato DJ Pro, Virtual DJ, DJ, Dejuiced, and even PC DJ on the software side, as well as the Denon DJ Prime series on the hardware side of things, I can now play streaming music on almost every platform I'd ever want to. And I do. I perform entire shows now on Twitch using Link, predominantly with the Denon DJ SC6000M players, and the experience is overall pretty seamless. There is a way to go with how deeply embedded streaming is into the various platforms, and there's no doubt that other ways of playing music won't be entirely replaced by streaming, even in the long term. But as another way to access music, streaming is only going to get bigger. It's the top story of 2020 for me, along with... Yes, we go from streaming to um, streaming. With bars, clubs and festivals closed or cancelled around the world, 2020 was the year that DJs had to find another outlet for their creativity, and streaming was, on the whole, the place they ended up. At first it was rather problematic, there was a lot of moving around to find platforms where copyright takedowns didn't ruin your day, and thanks to everyone working from home, things like webcams were almost impossible to buy for quite a long time. But now, here at the end of the year, the DJ streaming ecosystem has started to become quite established. Rather than fighting with platforms like Facebook, Instagram and to some extent YouTube, DJs have migrated largely to Twitch, which is currently having its own battles with the music industry over copyright issues, but is a 
well-established and feature-rich streaming platform, with community interaction very much at the forefront of what they do. The main alternative is Mixcloud, which is fully licensed and is very robust, especially considering they only launched their streaming features this year, but it currently lacks a lot of the community-building features available on Twitch. I'll also give a shout-out to Play DJ, a UK-based service which, like Mixcloud, is fully licensed and has a lot of potential for growth. Moving away from the tech aspect for a moment, I want to give my personal perspective on streaming. 2020 has largely sucked for pretty much everyone in the world, for some more than others of course and I always count my blessings. But I'm still a DJ and our industry has taken a serious hit, our workplaces have been largely taken away from us for nearly a year and so to see DJs around the world not only rise to the challenge of live streaming but in many cases thriving in this new environment has brought me true joy this year. Whether it's DJs picking up a ton of subscribers on Twitch or getting paid gigs on streams or doing corporate Zoom parties, some are making money. Rarely it's enough to replace the income lost from actual gigs, but enough to soften the blow. And on top of that, the creativity I've seen flourish in these times has been breathtaking. I've seen people go from plugging an audio jack into their phone on Facebook Live to full-on multi-camera next-level green screen productions watched by hundreds on Twitch in under a year. And best of all, the sense of community this shared experience has engendered has been truly heartwarming. DJing in real life can be a cutthroat business at times, but all this year I've seen DJs connect all over the world, helping and advising each other, encouraging growth with things like raid trains, talk shows, all kinds of stuff. I've connected myself with more DJs and music fans on a professional and personal level this year thanks to streaming than I ever have in my career before. Plus, I've been able to play exactly what I want the whole time, and as any working open format DJ knows, that's not always the case in real life. So yes, as much as 2020 has been terrible, streaming has been a light in the darkness for myself and many other DJs, and whilst there certainly will be a drop off in participation once the world starts to open up again, I like like many, won't stop streaming, and I won't stop talking about it here on the channel. It's an exciting outlet for creativity which is here to stay, no doubt about it. This might seem a little odd, but I have two products of the year which kind of do the same job, letting you produce a high quality live stream. For me personally, it's the Blackmagic A10 Mini Pro, a hardware video switcher and streaming encoder. As someone who makes videos for a living, I had a bunch of suitable cameras and other kit around already, which you do need to make the A10 Mini Pro shine. But when you have the right gear to plug into it, the power under the hood is truly impressive, and thanks to macros, a stream deck, and the BitFocus companion app, you can tap into that power and pull off a huge amount of stuff, all the while streaming directly from the hardware itself with no computer required for the encoding. They've released another version since, the A10 Mini ISO, which also records a feed from each device connected to it for editing afterwards, which I have yet to try, but the regular Pro is just superb. It's the beating heart of my streaming setup and seems likely to remain so for the long term. For most other people, the product of the year is completely free, and that's OBS Studio, aka Open Broadcaster Software. I've waxed lyrical here about the rise of DJ streaming in 2020, and there's no doubt that a huge amount of that is down to the power of OBS as the backbone of what the majority of DJs do online. It's not without its quirks, it's definitely a Windows first piece of software which hasn't been great for pro DJs who use Macs more proportionally than gamers, and I've seen a bunch of DJs invest in heavy duty Windows desktop computers to up their OBS game this year, but it's an incredibly powerful piece of software with a ludicrous amount of features, especially when you consider that it's free. Why is it free? Well, it's open source, meaning that everyone involved with the development gives their time and expertise for free, although they do of course accept donations towards the expenses of the core team. There are other alternatives to OBS Studio out there, both free and paid, but if you're getting into streaming today, OBS and its surrounding ecosystem is absolutely the best place to start. Everyone involved in creating and maintaining it deserves a salute from both myself and the wider DJ community, and so that's why, despite not being made for us, OBS Studio is the DJ product of 2020. 
So there you go, look back at some of the stories and trends, both big and small from the DJ equipment industry and the DJ game as a whole during the past 12 months. Of course, all of us are looking forward to saying goodbye, good riddance to 2020, and hopefully we can all move forward together as a DJ community to better and brighter things in 2021. Thank you all so much for watching these videos all year long. It really is appreciated. All of us at DJ City and Beat Source want to wish you a happy holidays, Please stay safe, look after yourselves, and I'll see you next year.